uh, I think we can start it. And uh, uh, this is the Yang Hong and from Meta. And uh, actually, I will uh, discuss two uh, topics in the rest of our. And uh, some of I actually did the work, and some of them uh, will be pure imaginations. Let's just continue. <laughs> and uh, so uh, the first is to try to uh, kind of like a comprehensive kernel function support. And uh, you will see what I mean here. And uh, so uh, currently, we try to utilize, uh, call some kernel internal functions, right? And uh, for example, you, you can use struct ops, actually call uh, some uh, congestion control functions in kernel. But the mostly popular use case actually is BPF helpers. And inside helpers, you can call kernel functions. But there's uh, more ways to do that. BPF helper, you cannot say every function create a helper for kernel. That's just not scalable. So uh, in the recent, uh, this year, actually, uh, the BPF K function ID set is introduced. And you can see this is a bunch of code I just copied from kernel source code. You have a uh, kernel function types and what kind of like types for kernel functions. And then and you define some kind of like a set of functions. And this set of functions actually associated with a type and, and a kernel function type and the program uh, type. So the, the particular uh, here is uh, to register a set. Like you give a program type and you give a ID set. The ID set actually is a bunch of functions but clarified to the K function type. In this way, for each program, you have a set of functions you can use and directly call kernel functions. In BPL programs, you can just say, OK, this is the kernel function prototype. It has a K symbol here. And actually, you can call this function directly and in your BPL program. So this is a big improvement and to call kernel functions in the BPL programs. And, but how about we try to use more kernel function in BPL programs? And uh, yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, currently it's just uh, like a BPF program type and a kernel function type. If we want to use much more kernel functions in BPF program, we probably need to clarify kernel function with more information. And it's just a couple of random examples I found this morning, actually. Like a proc, talk, a proc a C group show, if you say I want to call this function in kernel function, suppose all the arguments are resolved, right? And, but this argument actually has a mutex, mutex lock. And basically means this function could sleep. And, uh, and uh, so we, we probably want to present this information and attach to this function. And uh, so uh, during the verification time, we know oh, something could go wrong. And if we have uh, basically uh, it's not a sleepable program. And another function is like uh, insert inode hash and uh, so in this is again two functions, and inside is a bunch of spin lock as well. And these are actually you need to be careful and in certain contexts. And uh, uh, inside the lock, you probably cannot really call this program. Actually, uh, there's a lot of more uh, export symbol functions or other functions, and could be and enhanced with additional information and used by kernel. And uh, so how, how do we do this? And uh, so uh, actually, I implemented this uh, BTF declaration tag and, uh, uh, last year. And uh, uh, this is one of purpose for this tag. And although we didn't really implement anything yet in kernel. And uh, so uh, this BPF declaration tag is uh, try to tag some information to functions. And, uh, it will be encoded in VM Linux BTF. And for example, uh, for the proc C group show, and uh, uh, you can have an attribute here. Attribute say declaration tag, you have a string. Mutex log, column uh, C group mutex. So you encode this information inside the BTF associated with the function. And uh, in, this, in this way, uh, you will be able to, uh, during the uh, VM Linux parsing time, kernel loading time, you get this information. And later on, if uh, this function is called by BPF program, and you may reason in Verifier about what's the property of this, what, and what kind of lock it hold, or what precondition or post-condition for that. Yang Hong, I have a question. Sure. This is 
by the way, this is awesome work. Uh, I hope this comes true someday and then we'll be able to call yeah, yeah. functions. Uh, question regarding that mutex log declaration that you have. There. Yes. It says C group mutex. Does it mean it, it acquires C group mutex uh, within the function and releases it? Or is it an imbalanced log? Or does it mean it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in this, I just write a, a, a mutex log. You can have a more fine grain granularity of information. Okay. And uh, in, in this particular function, mutex lock actually has both mutex lock and unlock. Uh -huh. So you could say, okay, mutex lock uh, like a complete or full some information because attribute itself just take a, take a, some kind of like a string, and uh, you need a pretty pretty sure you need to define the kernel need to define some kind of like a simple language mm -hmm. and how this information and will be encoded. So for Imbalanced locks, at least, in the kernel has requires and like acquires yes, the, yes. Uh, this stuff. That part we can convert that part to the declaration tag, okay. it will be encoded in okay. the Linux, in the BTF. And the same thing for this I is, uh, insert I node cache thing. And, uh, and the uh, BTF, uh, the declaration tag, not just apply to functions, it can apply to structures, structure members, global variables. Function parameters, so a, a lot of latitude you can. Later, I have examples like uh, why it attached to the structure members will be also useful. This is a type tag, and a type tag uh, is used to annotation annotate types. And uh, and the most popular example here is uh, we have this uh, a few uh, pointer annotations and originally defined the address space, but and that's only available to sparse. And for example, you have a RCU pointer, and then and the sparse will do some checking, and the human being also visually do checking, although it, it doesn't really make an effect during the compilation to the actual code. And uh, But we could replace this RCU to the uh, uh, BTF type tag. And this type tag will be encoded in, in BTF and will continue to the uh, uh, VM Linux BTF. And uh, so currently the kernel actually supports the uh, BTF type for the user and the per CPU. They are actually used by the uh, uh, verifier. And uh, suppose you have a user pointer, you want to use a direct memory access and the verifier will flag out, that's illegal. And the per CPU will be useful and to detect a particular uh, structure member or global variables, it is a per CPU and uh, a pointer, and then you can use the uh, appropriate uh, per CPU helpers. And uh, uh, another interesting use case is a kind of like a print opaque kernel data, and why it's useful. For example, we have a task struct, right? And you have this BPF local storage, RCU, uh, and uh, BPF storage. And uh, if you go to the uh, BPF local storage, and uh, it actually will have this uh, uh, list. And this list actually is the opaque list. If you use a currently kernel helper function and BPF SN print BTF, which intention is to print the hierarchical of all the data rooted with the task structure, a particular BTF type. But it will stop here because it doesn't really know what type it is, right? It's just a edge list, a bunch of elements. So who knows? In this case, it will stop here. Just print a bunch of pointers, right? And uh, but we actually have a comments here. And uh, well, it's a list of a BPF local storage element. If we know this information, actually we can just continue print it down, right? That's cool. This is exactly this uh, the uh, declaration tag information could be useful here. And uh, uh, previously you, we have these comments, but we could annotate it with a tag and declaration tag to this member, like a B, BPF local storage element. May, may need additional information to traverse this edge list, but this is the basic information. You encode this, this uh, BPF local storage element here, and uh, then and, uh, uh, the VM Linux will have this information, and uh, the BPF SN printf BTF actually can be enhanced to print the actual, uh, this, uh, uh, the uh, storage comments. This HH list had the, the detailed comments and uh, further down print the BPF local storage element contents. So, yeah, I think this is the uh, 
first part. Any any comments, discussions, any new use cases? So I guess this is a. I mean, this is there will be a lot of work, sort of figuring out all these locations in the kernel, tagging them. Uh, yeah. Do you expect any pushback from people saying, "Look, don't add these things to my code. I don't like." It's uh, possible. We have to define first. That's why we didn't really do anything with this declaration yet. Mm -hmm. And we have to define some kind of like uh, language because you, if you tag many things, you have to have a, a consistent mm -hmm. mini language to see what, what this looks like, what the yeah. information coded. If you get this string and uh, what's just like a chase point, you have a mm -hmm. provider, you have a category, and then you have a final uh, name. So we, we may need a similar things. Yeah, you you are you agree. So it's it it will be take some effort, but the good thing is this information will attach to, to the uh, data structure or function function definition itself. So it's uh, like a uh, come and go is make it easy, and uh, if if people understand what's the semantics of this uh, tag declarations, and if if declaration changes, they should immediately just change that tag on the spot, right? On the declaration itself. Yeah, so, so I think I, I have like a follow-up question. Like for for what we have right now is like the funk ID and like type ID stuff, right? Like what, what happens well, rag, pretty regularly, someone renames the function and we don't notice that, right? And like we will get like some warning uh, during build time yeah. that will no one notice and all that stuff. The same thing will happen here, right? Like if someone renames BPF local storage LM, like we won't know until someone reports it as a bug and all stuff. So, like, yeah. uh, do you have any ideas how we can like catch this like at the compilation time and file compilation with some meaningful message? And uh, uh, in this particular case, and uh, uh, for the uh, tag stuff, and uh, and uh, yes, and the the tag is intended and to encode uh, again some functions. As you mentioned, the function name could be changed, right? And then kernel call that function. And uh, I don't have a good way to do that, to be honest. And unless we have a, a additional, just like a, a BTF ID set, right? And you have some of the there, and otherwise you get a zero and with the initialization variable. Yes. But, but this is, yeah, yeah, so. Well, I mean, like, we can do something like what Opt tool does, right? Like, we have resolved BTF IDs, we can probably generalize it to do like the BPF resolve whatever yeah. and they can uh, like th this tool can like check all this right like we'll need to teach like all the semantics obviously but yeah, yeah, it's yeah. probably like better way forward because otherwise we'll just like have this like bit rot essentially right and like s some of those annotations will be used very rarely like in some particular applications yes. right and yes. we'll just not notice it in time so we, we should i guess like my point is like th this is probably very important to think through like how to prevent yeah. like degradation of those uh, yeah. tagging? The, the, I, I haven't designed that, but typically the, the best thing is actually define uh, kind of like uh, not the function name. The verifier does not really shouldn't really check the function name. It should check what this function to do and map this function to a name in BTF. So in this way, you will be okay. And if function rename and the verifier only check okay this is semantics. With some name encoded the semantics of this function, that function exists, and that would be good. So that's that's uh, just that indirect. Uh, that's not really check function name, but check whether a particular stable name in verifier, and verifier will check that one, and so. If function name rename will be resolved in that case, but if function is gone, that's a different story. But function rename through this interaction probably will be okay, I would think. But I don't know. We we'll have to actually design. Uh, sorry, so, so actually, so here I'm, I'm from Bad Dance. In Bad Dance, we have similar like a requirement. So we have some many times we need to modify some new helper, PPF helpers, and it's not there. But we take a different approach. So I think this is very interesting. For from impedance, we do a, we do a, a generic helper. So basically, we just register two like a dummy functions to, to say you can write a like a dummy helper. Then the application call that function call that the dummy helper. Then we add a new kernel module to implement to really implement that uh, what we, we want to do in the kernel. So basically, the, the argument is that we trust the, the kernel module right as as we always. 
the copy module will provide the real functions. And then the PPF, the general helper, just provides a glue to tell the user level program to call it. So this way is pretty flexible for all that function rename, like all the change. So we, we don't, it's much easier to resolve. So I don't know if, if you guys consider a similar approach or a majority different approach to think about that. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't really investigate the uh, kernel module part, but I look at uh, the things and uh, looks like uh, uh, it's possible we convert quite some of uh, the uh, kernel module functions available to BPF program. And uh, so because they are kind of like, in, in many cases, they are kind of like a little bit simple. And also their functionality precondition after condition is limited. Uh, no, I mean, I don't need to convert, so we try like a call. You just so, call them. Yeah, but, but the children from BPF, you cannot call directly, right? Yeah. So we can try in the kernel module to call that function and then return back to the, to the BPF program. So you don't need to any convert. So yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, kind of like a, I would say, very, very like a short. Yeah, but the goal is BPF itself is not really go through the kernel module. Uh, so the, it's the general, general helper will, will, will call that so the, the general helper will call that uh, function in the kernel module. How do you specify the argument constraints? So yeah, we just say like how many types. So we will say how many arguments you put in the, so basically the, the, the user level program and the kernel module has to agree they, to know what they are calling about. So one is like function name, the other one is like how the argument they, they provide. So I mean, so it has to be consistent. If there's like not consistent, then they will have some issues. Um, so I want to go back to Andre's question and ask if there's a different way to accomplish this because you know um, I don't know the BPF, SN, printf, BTF internals, right? Uh, but uh, the problem that you pointed out, Andre, is because the local storage element is in a string, right? Not something that the compiler recognizes because it's inside of mm -hmm. a string literal, yeah. right? Uh, another because here you have to modify the code anyway, right? To, to, to annotate the structure yeah. in some way, right? Yes. It, if the structure was instead where you have the H list head. If that was a union between HList head and something that was strongly typed using BPF local storage, you could still access it with BPF, uh, with, sorry, with the HList head, but of course then your types use the actual type name in the union, and so you'd get a compiler error if you did the rename, and so it would uh, annotate that. And maybe even the BTF, the, the SN printf BTF would actually expand the stuff because you're using it in the union. So that's my question. That, that, that's actually the in, uh, initial idea I tried but that doesn't really work. And the reason is uh, the edge list, actually you go to the uh, list element itself, and uh, it need, need a list node. And if that structure has multiple list node, you don't know which one. Then you cannot really convert. So and it, which one has a multiple one? Is so, so basically you have a list element, right? Something yeah. like a list element, you need to have a list head again inside that yes. element. Yes. You could have more than one list. Then you don't know which one to really convert. Uh, which list head which, in the embedded structure? Exactly. Structures? Suppose you have a two elements. Two, two basically, the, the same data structure, like a BTF local storage element, there's a two list involved. Yep, yep. You don't know which one. You, you need additional information. Um, so you're, consider, you're, you're talking and, about the uh, case, if I understand right, where one of those uh, list heads is yes. the, the, the next and previous or whatever pointers in the list being referred yes, to here. Yes, there's another, there's another one to say the exactly. beginning of a list of something unrelated. Exactly. And so how do you walk the list? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, also, uh, we, we think this is Ugly, I mean, because this uh, is a list you, you have a union like uh, right. with a BPF local story so, element. They are uh, not really I, union. I get your answer, but it's perhaps not insurmountable. It's just cumbersome, right? But it does solve the because yeah. you oh, can yeah, still take. It's a, insurmountable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's you can take the, the, the same idea of uh, if, if you were to have used a union here, you could have used a union in both of the other two cases inside the uh, list element, right? In one case, you'd have a union with other list elements, and another, and in the second member, or the first member, depending on the order, right, it'd be union with some other type there. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. you could still derive the right information and still be compile time uh, type safe, right? Um, it does mean that you have to expand every use of uh, you know, generic structure into a union to get that, and so maybe yeah. that's not desirable in all cases, but it does solve Andre's problem. Yeah, yeah, if you have union here and there, it may, may work, I mean. 
It's it might work, but it will be an act that's too active. Like we can do it for like BPF local storage maybe, but like if you go and like do it in task struct, it will be like, what? No, so I don't think. Yeah, but, but you are right, it is, that, that's a hack, and I tried early, it should work, but it's not pleasant, I mean, the, from the code perspective, you are right. <laughs> so there's one other problem that we have sometimes when dereferencing stuff in PPF is the, the, there are fields called private data, which is like a void stop pointer. Yes, yes. Do you think we can annotate that, like, it is it is decided at runtime based on who is the owner of this entry or like who is the owner of this FS context thing. We can we can pre that's why I mentioned that we can have some kind of a language. I don't but if you have a limited choice it's possible. I mean it's, it's not arbitrary. I don't know how to encode that. So I, we, we have to case by case study what kind of things are needed to encode. You are correct, a lot of this file is private, right? And uh, you cannot really define that thing on the private because yeah. generic data structures have too many things there. Exactly. And, like, yeah, you have to have that people different to conversion at the basically the, the, the local side. Generally, it has some information to decipher in the struct, right? Like yes. I am, I am of a, so maybe we could have a map of some sort that says, this field represents the type of the dentry, yes. right? And if, or like type of FS context, and if it's this like fuse, or if this is like something like legacy, that. Yes. whatever. And yes. then based on the value of this thing, yes. you could the, the, the type can then be inferred to a newer newer type or something. Uh -huh. This could be encoded in the decal type tag as well, I guess. Like yeah, some something like that. You you a little bit of high level information provided to the attribute, a little bit high level than private, give a little bit more context. Yeah, it's possible. Um, I had a question about your uh, the K funks that call uh, that acquire like a lock within it. Um, how do you verify uh, that or enforce that by the time the program ends that that lock is unacquired or that there aren't any like safety things that we're uh, trespassing upon? So you are talking about the verifier side, right? Yeah, or I think like a couple of slides ago you said something about like how you can tag something as like this function acquires a mutex um, within it. Yeah, and uh, so that's, uh, I didn't really do any study yet, but the idea is we have a program types, and uh, uh, we potentially know the location this program will run. We, we should know that in most cases, kprob or kfunction or some program. And from this location, we may annotate relative information about the restrictions for this relocation. And then we should match with the uh, kernel function and uh, uh, to satisfy this relocation, uh, the, the, the constraints in this relocation. For example, you, you, you kind of like a tracer function and uh, uh, this function is, uh, uh, for example, in the uh, MII context, right? In that case, and we don't really want any spin lock. And then if you call kernel function has spin lock, and then you have problems. So something along that, yeah. So verification could be a little bit more complex. You need a, a both a program context, where this program is run, and uh, also need the uh, function itself. The function itself also need a lot of information provided to, to satisfy verify. Uh, Johan, could you go back like a couple slides before? Sure. So I think, <coughs> yeah, even, even more. So I think you're answering like how this uh, mutex lock, like whether it was acquired will be verified, right? Uh, but I think Joanne was asking the even before, like can you go back even more? Uh, yeah, are you, are you asking about this get type acquire stuff? <laughs> No, I think I was asking more on the other slide, where it's like you have a function where you can acquire some mutex, and then like enforcing that like that mutex is released by the time the program ends, or that if there's like a, um, if like you're calling a kernel function, there's an if branch where it's like if this condition is met, then you acquire the mutex, or you don't. Just making sure that like everything is released by the time the program ends. You know, it's like Yeah. Yeah, with logs, I don't think we can. So I don't 
think it will be possible. Like when the logs are still held after program ends, because that's what these annotations, that kernel annotations, are doing. This underscore underscore acquire this or that. It's only potentially doable through the log depth if we do something like log depth inside VPF and do all of this log checking dynamically. But that's even bigger story. But what, what can be done is if, if like, uh, apart from the cave funk stuff, right? Like you can annotate these the kernel data structure members saying that this needs a mutex. And and then you could in BPF provide primitives to acquire that mutex in a sleepable program so that you could access the data structure members safely. Yeah. So while the kernel function story is a, is a, is a bit more complicated because there are a bunch of branches in, in where the log exactly, can be taken. Yeah. But the data structure stuff could still work and be pretty useful, actually. Yeah, data structure may be a little bit easier, but kernel function, yeah, it's really hard. I, I don't know what kind of language we will use at all <laughs> at this point. How to do in the BPF signature. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I said. That's just a initial baby step, I mean. So <laughs> how to really use it. My other concern would really be the, it'd be, it seems like it'd be fairly trivial to deadlock yourself in, the, in BPF now and like just lock the kernel up. By the way, if necessary, we could uh, easily convert existing attribute I like acquire release and to the BTF tag. That's I think like, straightforward. I'm not too pessimistic about this, right? Like there, there are, if you if you have a function that yeah. it, it, like that has like a, that has a mutex there inside and it is releasing yes. and acquiring the mutex, you yeah. could annotate this with a simple annotation, and then you could use that information to s a check whether this can be this should be used in a sleepable program. Yeah, and this is very this is very valid. The imbalanced locks. Uh, yeah. Like where this will get ugly, I think, is if if that if somebody comes along and changes that function, like adds a mutex to it or removes the mutex, mm -hmm. <clears throat> then they would have to, I guess, also update the annotation. But your program that was calling it would now need to be recompiled or some or re yeah. thought through, <laughs> refactored, re-verified, and refactored. Um, True. But I've been. Mean, I don't know. This is on the edge, right? Like maybe there's tons of stuff in there that is that is this doesn't apply, and it's super useful to have, right? Yeah. Like I'm, I'm not. So I just think it, it, as a generic problem, it's quite hard. I think program would need to be re-verified. I'm just thinking. No, but refactored even too. Like your program could now become wrong because of the annotation that was changed. Like if you thought there was a mutex release and somebody refactored the kernel code to pull the re mutex out of that function, yeah. Now your BPF program is wrong, and will not will. Presumably not past the verifier. Exactly. Like this is this is this is yeah. this is what we expect, right? The damage, the maximum damage should be taken by the BPF program rather than the kernel. So the BPF program should be rejected. This we we, we expect verifier rejections between like multiple versions of the program and chain load them in like reverse chronological order. <laughs> but but this is the same for helpers, right? I mean kernel helper call some kernel function. Although we currently did the call simple, if you call complex one, it it could change. And then I don't know. So it's it's the same. Yeah. So is the goal here to have <laughs> thank you. So is the goal here to have like perfect verification that it's safe hundred percent of the time to call this kernel function? Or is the goal just to be safer than writing your own kernel module? Because I think the latter is what I would target. And I think that's absolutely realistically possible. And then, like, we can peel away and add safety as we go. But because uh, this is fantastic, I think the end result is still a lot better than making your own modules out of trick. Yeah, we we can try a kernel fun kernel module function. That's also my first target. I mean, think try to implement a kernel module style of things. I I think the the. the I would also agree that the goal should be the latter. Like, if we claim perfect verification, people are going to challenge this heavily, right? So yeah. the, the goal is to improve the, 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 the safety of, like, if you want yeah. to implement your kernel module-like logic, here's BPF providing the same sort of functionality. And it is, it is better to do that because you're less likely to make a mistake as because the verifier is going to try to catch most of these issues because yeah. of the stuff you're building. Mm -hmm. And then as, as the ecosystem develops, it gets safer and safer. If we say that this is going to be foolproof all the time, then, uh, <laughs> uh, 
the other thing that I think uh, the other idea is about uh, the goal of this uh, is maybe make the BPF as a group for the kernel module to grow its uh, feature or function into the kernel. For example, we have a trace point, uh, that kind of things. So, but uh, with the kernel module, doesn't need to change the kernel directory. You can use uh, the BPF to grow its feature into the kernel itself and change the behavior, part of the behavior of kernel, that kind of things. Yeah, I, I don't know your, your question. I will end on what, what exactly you are expecting. A kernel module here is just function. This, we, we target on any kernel function, not just kernel module functions. And uh, so not sure exactly what your question is. You just uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, uh, because we just mentioned uh, uh, the purpose of this uh, is either to improve, the, for example, make the kernel module more safe or or make uh, make the the BPF program can have more feature. Now, uh, the other way uh, to to look at uh, this uh, proposal maybe is uh, to make the kernel module have the ability to change the behavior of the kernel. Because right now, if you, some feature, for example, you want to uh, hook at some uh, trace point uh, for the kernel module, is uh, maybe difficult. So mm -hmm. if uh, with the BPF, we have a of uh, capability to do that. So kernel yeah. module can use uh, BPF to hook at some uh, type and some hook and call back to the kernel module itself to implement some feature. That's possible too. Kernel module could use BPF for actually. It's, it's possible as well, I would say. BPF program can run kernel modules. Most like BPF programs can implement kernel modules and kernel modules can use That's BPF. why, but, but I think that's probably not recommended, I, I would say. I, 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 from the user journey's perspective, like I'm more interested in the get rid of kernel modules and move them over to BPF. This is what we did with like, our security telemetry stuff when we were building BPF LSM. And the more functionality you provide to do that safely, it has, just has a lot of benefits there. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. the goal I said, kernel, kernel module is export of symbols because they are kind of like a standalone and uh, not like a lot of uh, inch function relationships. Okay, seems uh, no questions, so we go to the next one. Next one is more about imaginations and making write BPF program more pleasant. Yeah, the first is more abstraction and source level. So, <laughs> so one more use case that I wanted to mention, you didn't mention it, is uh, instead of, oh, not instead of, in addition to, right? As, as another application of the, this BTF tag is to use it to tag uh, BPF code itself, right? So right now we have the static subprocs and global subprocs. And like global subprocs have a lot of advantages in terms of like uh, limiting the complexity of like what, what kind of code like BPF, uh, BPF verifier has to verify and all this stuff. But it has limitations compared to static functions because it doesn't, like the verifier doesn't know uh, you know, like limits of like the integer. So like in static function, you might know that like this, this argument one always has like values from zero to 100. Like we lose that in global functions. So I think this could be a great mechanism to kind of like allow user, VPF developer, right? To provide hints to the verifier for global function uh, input argument restrictions, like output argument restrictions, stuff like that. We, we've done some of that based on like types uh, and like some, some you know, some particular cases like where like first level the reference of the memory we allow to do that and all that stuff, but the tagging can be like an answer to kind of feature parity between static subprogram and global subprogram. What do you do you have anything like that in mind? And like Okay. Uh, the good thing is also that uh, we need that only for Clank, right? So like we can use it yeah. like from day one basically for BPF programs. I, I would say it's possible, and uh, so we can annotate a little bit more detailed information precondition after condition, and the verifier can try to verify based on these assumptions, and and that's maybe a little bit easier, 
and if assumption doesn't matter, you just reject. So it's, it's, uh, in, instead, uh, you just uh, like uh, uh, explore and all possibilities. And maybe, maybe that's a, a good way to do, to improve, uh, I mean, verification speed. Yeah, and also maybe other benefit. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and uh, let's go to uh, see how we can write interesting BPL programs. Okay, <laughs> the first is like uh, try to explicitly express uh, parallel loops. And uh, yeah, so this is just uh, item like uh, auto item objects and you do something with this item. And uh, the uh, object can be collections or maps array or dynamic allocated array or some other stuff. And the reason we want to have this explicit loop is uh, it will be show no interloop dependence. And the, the, so in this case, actually, we could have uh, explicit special BPF instruction encoded mm -hmm. and uh, to verifier. So verifier can maybe do a little bit of tweak, but shorten uh, verification time. There's really no need so to do it. We, we tried this before, right? We, last time we tried this, we, we tried to put the whole control flow graph into the verifier and then yeah. verify the control flow graph. Yeah. So like, sorry, if I, maybe you have a next slide. I'm sorry if I yeah. jumped in too early. Yeah. But like, I mean, I'm just interested in this in general because we tried it once before, right? So like, the question is like, it's nice to write this at the C level. So, but then the question is like, what is the LVMR IR look like? And then what is the B, like the actual BPF code instructions look like? How do you verify that and ensure that like it's a block, you know? Like without, it feels to me like you need to go into like LLVM IR and do like an intrinsic or something to make this happen correctly. That's a good question. I just come with this slide Sorry. this morning. And I just so I don't know threw a whole bunch of questions. So like way, way long time ago, we tried to do this with like an intrinsic. Like yeah. Just a, just so that just a BPF yeah. back in the transit, yeah, yeah, yeah. it went all the way through the compiler, and then yeah, the yeah, compiler yeah. could just say like, "I guarantee yeah. there's no jumps in here." Yeah. But the problem was we n I never figured out how to get the verifier to do it without building the full CFG in the verifier, which we did, yeah. and then we ripped it out. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was kind of ugly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyways, cool. I'm, I, yeah. I that, wish that, we had an answer. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a way like a, a high level or construct. We may have some special IR and uh, special instructions, and uh, so we can we can uh, pass this information and to verifier. So verifier and uh, can assume this. If anything doesn't match, it can reject rather. Some something like that. Yeah, it's it's tricky though. I'm I'm not sure. Maybe there's some like like the verification people know that, but like I I never figured out how to get the how to how to get the verifier to. I guess verify the to have a loop control flow and the control, without analyze, a full yeah. control flow group. Yes, right? yes, I agree. I agree. Yeah. That's that's really hard. Okay. That's a, that's why we just a, a proposal, and uh, so we we, we can <laughs> work on that. I got excited. <laughs> we jumped in. And, <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, so oh, the next thing I want to discuss is uh, macros. I spend a little bit of time to deal with these things. And uh, currently for tracing program, we have VM, VM Linux.h. And uh, for networking programs, typically they are including a bunch of UAPI headers because they do, do not do tracing. So oh, they get all these macros, mostly macros, and if it's a BPL programs. And in the future, and when networking program is added with certain tracing capabilities, it's possible they need to use VM Linux.h for core relocation purpose. And in this particular case, for example, and uh, for to use a VM Linux sort edge, they include the first, they include the other stuff, then they will be really, really likely have redefinition errors. Because VM Linux defines some type, and you have some type later on. So we have a problem here. And uh, so what, what are possible solutions? Right? And I kind of like working on the uh, LLVM BPF accept identical diff attribute. This attribute you try to ignore identical type definitions. And uh, for structure, for type diff, or for or enum, all these things. And uh, in, in this particular example, if you have a structure S into A, the first has a struct attribute, the second one will be ignored instead of a redefinition error. 
and the possible future extension could be handle core based type definitions. So basically, if two type not identical, but mostly the same, and then we may still be able to proceed, try to ignore. So in this case, hopefully we can resolve the uh, VM Linux.h plus other .h files issues. And, uh, uh, but for macros, actually there's an alternative solution. We tried earlier, but we didn't proceed. And uh, uh, we can encode the macros into DORF with additional compiler options. And we can convert these macros to a VM Linux.h macro.h. And then you don't need to include all these string.h's. And then everything you just VM Linux. And uh, from BPF perspective, and uh, there's a downside for this, and a possible BTF space overhead in ELF will be five meg, because the kernel actually has a lot of macros. You just consider even this list for each element is a macro. We also included in the ELF, so a lot of things there. And, uh, but the uh, plus thing is uh, uh, VM Linux macro.h, we're also including kernel internal macros as well. So this make your write a BPL program can use close source code close to the kernel itself. I think but, it's also a problem like when you have multiple different definitions of the same macro, right? Which can happen across multiple files in the VM Linux. So what do we do in that case? Uh, that's actually is, uh, unlikely based on the previous experiments. And uh, uh, most macros is in header. If that one, the same as other BPF, uh, BTF redefinition, and that means that you have same uh, structure name in two different places or three, we kind of like it's best to modify the source code. Try to make that a little bit different. Well, we have a pretty typical use case, like even for B BPF, right? Like where we have like the function definition where you specify kind of like what do you do with each function identifier, right? And like yeah. in different cases, yeah. you do different definitions based on like which yeah, file yeah. it is, right? Yes. So, yes. Uh, we, we have the same problem here. If you define all this in the .c file, the same macros in different C, yes, we have the same issues. We have to figure it out. That, yeah. But mm, most of the thing we could have two words. We ignore all the micro in dot c, just including the dot h. That's as uh, I mean, as a first base and including all comments, which should satisfy nine nine point nine percent use case. Yeah, that's my last slide, basically. Can you go back to the previous one? Okay. <laughs> oh, actually, one more. <laughs> oh yeah. Loops, loop stuff. So. Uh, we discussed it a little bit, but like, how hard would it be to teach? Uh, not very far. Very far doesn't know about this. Teach about uh, teach compiler about transforming loops like this into BPF loop calls with callback. So like, extract the body of the loop in a callback, and actually write it as a BPF loop call in that callback. Is it doable at all? Is it, it is uh, potentially doable in a uh, client front end, but. The potentially will be the argument in clan community. So <laughs> because it's, concep it's conceptually yeah. very similar to what compilers do for like a sync uh, transformations, right? Yes, and there's a, we may be able to you basically reuse some code code from the C plus plus side. It's it's totally possible, but there may be some. Argument. I'm just saying there is a precedent, so yeah. C++? Oh, so you're saying for, you would do this in C++, you're thinking? Yes, so basically the simple. I've never tried to write C++ to BPF. How does it go? Uh, today, actually, you can compile C++. There's no compiler side restrictions. You can compile C++ code to BPF. So like, what is this, like, what is the? I didn't check, but you can compile. In this case, I'm not <laughs> sure whether it works or not. But the existing, uh, some simple C++, C, basically C code compiled at C++, it works. So. I was just thinking, like, you, you <laughs> might be able to pick this up at the IR on the BPF backend, right? And then yeah. turn it into a function it, It's call. possible. We, we could we may be able to do something. What, yeah, yeah, I don't actually know what that looks like. Yeah, we, in we may IR. in the early IR stage, we may yeah. do something. Done? Okay.
Oh, question? Sure. A macro? Uh, regarding the VM Linux uh, problem, they include um, uh, VM Linux .h. This way or this way? Yes, this, yes, one? this, uh, this one. way. Uh, so I think we are all aware that uh, there are definition problems, and uh, now the, the solution is uh, usually that you include just the first one, and then you, when there are collisions, you just uh, add the define uh, yourself manually, probably. Um, would it be possible? I don't know if this is the correct assumption that uh, you uh, regenerate the VM Linux .h every time um, when you build the uh, ABPF program. But if it is the case, could you regenerate the VM Linux .h depending on uh, um, the include that you have afterwards? Uh, I mean, um, to generate a custom VM Linux Linux .h that does, does does not have the collision to avoid the collision. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think that's potentially need every time you regenerate the VM Linux .h. based mm -hmm. on what the headers, right? If you have existing headers, it's possible you could, uh, with some kind of like code per processing, and uh, get this uh, structure, or the uh, enamel other stuff and uh, encode it somewhere, and then you try to regenerate the VM Linux .h. And then during regeneration, you try to exclude all these existing types. Yes. I would say that is a hassle for user, and the typical user they probably just generate a VM Linux .h once and use it for quite some time for different programs. So your your method potentially work in for a single program, but if your method has many programs every time to generate. And another thing is the VM Linux .h and uh, is kind of like uh, generated across different, basically, uh, compilations, right? Uh, different kernels in, in, in general. And, uh, but, but again, and all these all, all this, uh, uh, standard uh, header files are UAPI, uh, UAPI headers, so they are supposed to be uh, stable. So VM is uh, probably okay in most cases with this UAPI headers, not like a kernel internal that it change. But the UAPI can headers. be extended, so they are not that yeah, stable, that, especially for BPF. That's true. It can be extended, yeah. But, yeah. but like, I'm trying to understand the, your question. Like, are you saying that like, we should just generate subset of VM Linux types that are not used from other headers? Exactly. Well, it, like on the next slide, right, like this uh, identical or whatever it's called now, BPF yeah. accept identical definition. That's basically like the idea, okay. except that like you don't require yeah. a programmer to do anything. Like you, we are saying that like some types, even if they are redefined, that's okay to the compiler. Mm. I think that's like way more mm, logistically easier to use solution. So we just okay. need to get it upstream. Mm. The, I will <coughs> shed some light of how we end up, like probably some history due. So uh, this has been for, well, a year or so now, our fight with the LLM community about this extra flag. And one of the suggestions was to just to create a tool that will indeed would do what you're describing. You include VM links that age, then a bunch of headers, and the tool will go and will see all of the compilation errors. So it will be clang based tool that sort of does compile, but then removes all of the stuff that actually like duplicate, generates some other like that page for you, and then you will pass it pass it to compiler. So essentially it would mean that right now, well in the past we had like clang would compile like x86 and then LLC and we feed this like horrible monster and this is how we're compiling BPF program. Now we have just clang, clang target BPF compile everything, it's nice. With this tool, it's like everyone essentially would need to do another step of like, it's just install this special clang based tool, then teach everyone how to do this regeneration of VM Linux and so on and so forth. So just like operationally, it's like so much pain. That's why like this idea was discussed, but rejected. That's why we're trying to go with this accept identical def. I thought it would have been uh, like an uh, extension of BPF, BPF tool uh, dump uh, uh, BTF, uh, but yeah, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. Mm, no, yeah. it's you had you have to do the whole like client mm. parsing. It's, you in have in to that case, it will be the, you cannot just like yeah. string match the types. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It needs to be a, a LLVM tool and a client front end tool and I try to compare and ignore this 
definitions here. Um, I, I have a question. So for this attribute, accept identical, does it have to become with the first definition or could it be like a labeled as a second definition? Uh, so uh, current, uh, currently, the idea is uh, we label the first one and we ignore the rest. So and uh, if you go to the second one, currently, it, it will still have a redefinition. We, we would like to uh, be able to reorder the header files because um, in Google, we have some styling enforcement policies. We would like this uh, VMX to be the last one, not necessarily to be the first <laughs> one. So, <laughs> yeah, so it would be great if we can allow this uh, attribute to be tagged as the second one, not to have to be the first one. I, I think it's okay, and uh, uh, so uh, you can uh, annotate uh, everything with this BPF except identical diff. And uh, the idea is uh, you see the first one, the rest must be identical, regardless of attribute or not. And you can just have this push client attribute in the beginning and the, in the end, something like that. It, it, I think it should work. Yeah, and yeah, like yeah. you, you, don't you need, need to, to annotate it first. You don't need to put this on every type. Yeah, there is you just a, have a client. Like current, currently, the way we do pop. attribute preserve access index for the core, so it's only one line at the beginning of VM Linux that age. So if you want VM Linux that age to be less, just move this line, put it first in your file. <laughs> <laughs> if your styling guide allows. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying it'd be great to have that. This is awesome, actually. This is an awesome feature. OK, I'm wrong out of battery. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>